but you don't have to clean up anything. Just sit yourselves in such a way that you can see Bob and the screen. And this is our sponsor, Bob Manis. <laughs> oh, and incidentally, um, the sacred water that we gathered, I'm trying to keep a jug on that corner of the, of the table by the back door. So if you want to fill your water bottle or use the sacred water in your drink or anything like that, we got plenty. It's for the whole weekend. Just feel free to use it however you want. with a poem by my buddy, Bosco. Um, he's of the opinion poems are best read twice. Once, to inform everybody, and secondly, to elect, once you know the poem, you can follow along. So, <coughs> this poem's called Svishen which is German, it means between. I have been present to the space between I and thou. I have looked into the void where the goddess lives, where the stars align perfectly with heaven. I have looked into the emptiness of my own soul that queer, peculiar space where it quickly becomes an impenetrable forest of dirt, where the rhythm of essence becomes dangerously syncopated, where pain trickles from seeping concrete blocks. Where were you? Sufficient. I have been present to the space between I and thou. I have looked into the void where the goddess lives and the stars align perfectly with heaven. I have looked into the emptiness of my own soul, that queer, peculiar space where it quickly becomes an impenetrable forest of dirt, where the rhythm of essence becomes dangerously syncopated, where pain trickles from seeping concrete blocks. Where were you? So, <laughs> there's, a, there's a little alchemy there for you. Vasco got around. Okay, a little logos to begin. Yep. <clears throat> this, this lecture, uh, has been predominated by synchronicity. This is not the lecture I had planned a month ago. But as things would have, it, I, I think this will enrich everyone. I hope more than a, a, a kind of an alchemical um, lecture. 
Let's talk about the difference between Opus Divinum and Opus Alchemicus. Uh, <clears throat> in traditional Christian theology, op uh, Opus Divinum starts in heaven with God. And he comes to earth in the form of his son and is transformed and then returns to heaven. <clears throat> in alchemy, the assumption is one starts here on earth and through the process of alchemy ascends to heaven the albedo experience. And then, upon the transformation, returns again to Earth in this lifetime. So remember, we did the tripartite um, process. Here it is again. We have the rite of separation, where where you are, you leave. Then we have the rite of transformation, the liminal space where change fundamentally occurs, and that's where we are now. We are still in the Temenos. And then, uh, uh, then there is the rite of incorporation, which we will have a celebration for to return to what I call the Negretto experience. So that's just a little background to the difference that I'm talking about when I talk about Latter-day Alchemy. Um, <clears throat> Um, but um, I th I, I'm not moved, I'm very moved by the alchemy of old, but I think it serves us well to update it because the process is still the same. There is still the mystery. There is still the potential for transformation. And so... <laughs> Um, what I'd like to do, is, uh, I'm not going to take the time to write it down. Maybe I don't know if I should. Um, okay, <clears throat> conceptually, I should write this down, but I'm not going to. Um, <clears throat> you have the negretto. Um, oh, by the way, this is much more fully elaborated in my book, but. <clears throat> um, for our experience, we've got the negretto here, the here and now, everything, as I explained yesterday. The bump and the grind of life, the bills, the struggle, your health, your joys, um, everything is here. And because of Jung, again, we have a much deeper understanding of the unconscious process as alive, as vital, not some inert, thing. Oh, that's just the unconscious. So I gave it a new name for our purposes because I wanted the burrito to suggest mystery, excitement, uh, a dynamic exchange between this world and our unconscious. But when I use the word unconscious, it just sounds like a rock someplace. Oh, um, that's granite. That's the unconscious. And that's hardly the concept that I think in reality the unconscious is about. So I changed the name to the burrito, and that's how I'll refer to it, to keep alive, hopefully, the sense of mystery in the journey. Now the idea is to get a... Um, a conversation going as best as you can between your life in the negretto, your, your ego, and making a connection to the burrito and its consciousness, or the capital S in self, as Jung would say, the organizing principle of the unconscious, and by extension, the ego. So that's what I want to talk about, because if you can really get that going well, there's a very good opportunity to have an albedo experience 
which is the transformative experience of Opus Alchemicus. And that can be obtained, that can be realized, that can be lived. And um, I don't want to dwell there too much. I will just say that um, you don't need anybody else to confirm that you've had an albedo experience. It confirms itself for you. And um, we'll just leave it at that. Um, but it's, it's, it's very obtainable in this lifetime in your own journey if you're awake to it. <clears throat> and the, the vehicle that I have found um, is, is what I call the aesthetic it. And that's what you're chasing right here. This is your aesthetic. Thank you, Sherry. Um, because you don't know what your aesthetic is precisely but you know it when you're doing it, when you can feel it. Um, Colleen, Colleen knows a great deal about her aesthetic. And I have found that if you're true to your aesthetic, courageously, it will take you into a relationship with the burrito that will answer you. It answers in its own fashion, in its own way, and it, it doesn't come begging. <laughs> uh, it, it has its own language. It has its own, its own style. Um, but once you, I can feel it now, once you get that connection with the burrito, it can give you chills. Mm -hmm. and, you know, how often, it, and I think the path to the, along the aesthetic it is not a path of judgment. What I really like about what I came up with in the book was, was the journey is, uh, of, of following your aesthetic is not a journey of judgment. It's not about being good. It's not about being right. And conversely, it's not about being wrong or bad. And as we talked about yesterday, we know the bad guys. It, it's not a surprise. Um, so, so let's just dismiss that, what I call <laughs> the cesspool of judgment. Let's make every effort to understand each other and, and bypass the judgment paradigm as the only measure of relationship. I get a lot of traction in my practice these days. I say, you know, judgment by its very nature is like a knife. It does one thing. It separates this from that. And if you're right and somebody is different from you, then they gotta be wrong. If you're good and they're different from you, they've gotta be bad. And that's not so good for relationship because it's divisive. So when you use the judgment paradigm, it's like taking a knife to a relationship. Either you're perfectly aligned, ah, we see this exactly the same way, so we're both good. But if you differ from my opinion, you gotta be bad, you know? And so I have found that these circles will touch under one condition, that we agree I'm good and you're bad. Or we agree that you're right and I'm wrong. They touch, but they don't cross over. They can't. Paradigmatically, they can't. It's impossible. It's like asking a knife to do something else other than be a knife. It doesn't work very well. So what I, what I talk about a lot with my patients is let's go to the position of understanding and with that paradigm, the circles can cross over like that Venn diagram we learned about in seventh grade, which I never understood the importance of, but now it's got some utility because now we can be different with understanding in that mutually inclusive place, but we don't have to be the same. We can be 
And when you, when you find through understanding that you're with somebody else in that place of mutual inclusion, you get very cool things like compassion, like kindness. Um, and, it, and if you, sympathy for the other person. I understand. That's the way. And if you, if you push those circles really far together, you get empathy because you're effectively walking in the other person's shoes through understanding. But you can't do it with judgment. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> thank you for letting me get on my soapbox for that one. But I, I, I just, she said it. Percy said it. She, she came right out and said, they're judging it. You know? And, and look what judgment is doing to Ethiopia. Mm. I mean, I, I, I don't mean to, I don't mean in any way to simplify the pain and the suffering of those people. For, but I, I just see so much damage done on, on the insistence of the judgment paradigm. Mm. That's all. So, um, oh, oh, the other thing I want to say. So, you know, it's very easy to rush to judgment. Oh boy, knee-jerk response. There, but that's wrong. Sometimes what I'm challenged with is I can't get enough, if you will, data points to satisfy my need to understand. I just can't understand this. I know it's not bad, I know it's not wrong. What's happening in Ethiopia is bad, and I'm not afraid to judge that. That's wrong. But that's not what we're talking about. We're, we're talking about human relations on a more positive basis. So I just hold the rush to judgment in abeyance and say, I need more information to understand this, but I'm not going to judge it. And that's kind of an emotional challenge for me because um, like everybody else, it's a lot easier to judge somebody and this doesn't preclude an opinion. It's like, I don't much care for gossip. That doesn't make the person that gossips wrong or bad. It just means I don't care for it, and I'll probably keep my distance. But I draw the line at declaring them bad or wrong, because I, I, I try very hard to refuse the temptation of the judgment paradigm. Now, on a little more sophisticated level, that also works on an internal basis. I've been talking about it interpersonally. Intrapersonally. A lot of people have swallowed the judgment paradigm and they apply it to themselves. And in that application, they alienate themselves from themselves. And one of the first questions I ask patients when I see them and we get working, I said, do you consider yourself to be one of your own best friends? And invariably, I get one of two answers. You know, Dr. Baba, I've never thought of that. I've never thought of myself as a best friend of me. Or I get, nah, I, you know, honestly, I don't like myself very much. Invariably, I get that. And so I invite everybody. <laughs> To, to think about making friends with yourself when you go into that dark place where you don't like yourself or you've made a mistake or, or you're just at, at odds with yourself. Think about compassionately embracing yourself, resolving not to make that mistake again, and being friends. I, it, it works. Um, people in the to the middle, later stages of our work will invariably say, you know, I'm either working on it, I'm getting it, or yeah, I'm a pretty good friend of mine. I treat myself okay. So we'll leave it at that. That's not really alchemy, but I couldn't, couldn't resist. All right, so let's talk about the aesthetic in, <laughs> which we've been doing. <clears throat> so. I say, look for it, find it, follow it, hone it, refine it, stay true to it, be courageous. 
Tim, Colleen, have lived their aesthetic. And, and I have had patients that have lived their aesthetic. And frequently, I'll applaud them for living their aesthetic because it's, it's a, a value of mine. And not infrequently, I will hear, well, Dr. Bob, it hasn't made me a lot of money. And I say, don't confuse following your aesthetic with its material worth. Allow your spirit to run with your aesthetic and work hard to make money or save your money. But don't burden the value of what your aesthetic can do for you with Negretto standards. I had an art teacher <clears throat> tell a young man who had a lot of potential, uh, learn how to sell shoes or operate an elevator and keep doing that. And, and yeah. yes, and... and uh, but we are so reduced in terms of our values mm -hmm. that we can, it, you know, it's like the judgment paradigm. I, I can't help myself but ask, you know, what material value has it yielded? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's completely the wrong question to ask of your aesthetic. Instead, <clears throat> like with Sherry, John, you know, poets, artists, and it, it thrives. It's, it's wonderful. That's part of what has drawn me so powerfully to the confluence is the message that we are trying to articulate. And for me, um, <clears throat> Tim would say it differently, but for me, it's, it's, it's encouraging people to find their aesthetic and live their aesthetic and find the spirit that goes with that. And you just might find that you're going to connect with the burrito, and the burrito is going to answer your request to respond along aesthetic, uh, along a, a, an aesthetic vector. And boy, when it got when it's and and I ha I'll have an ex um, an example of someone who's done that, and it's very exciting because. It comes with synchronicity. It comes with dreams. Um, like I said, um, the burrito speaks its own language, and uh, you got to be true to it. You got to commit to it. So I'm proselytizing. Um, now, <laughs> it's never too late, and it's never too early. You know, Children can start with their aesthetic. And we all can start, as we have been, working with our aesthetic. So I say to embrace one's aesthetic, it's never too late, it's never too early. Skip and I were talking about grandchildren and, and inviting them into a world of your aesthetic. Um, Skip has given his grandson uh, some of his calligraphy and framed it for him. And when they get together, maybe they'll practice calligraphy. You know, everybody's aesthetic is different. Uh, you know, this is one form. Uh, there, there are many others. But it's that aesthetic it that I encourage everybody to engage in. Okay, <clears throat> let me tell you, I have permission to use his name. His name's Doug Seward. Um, he's a patient of mine. Uh, we started early, working together in the early 90s. He's a very bright guy. He went to a very prestigious college on the East Coast. Um, and he was very depressed. When we started working together, he was entrenched in a very difficult marriage. And our initial work was to help him break the shackles of the world he found himself caught up in and liberate him. And in that process, I introduced him to some of Carl Jung's ideas because I can't help myself sometimes. <laughs> um, 
Mm. It usually helps. It does. <laughs> but, you know, you teach a patient the concept of shadow without judgment, and boy, that frees them up. You know, that we've all got a shadow. You know, let's let's see if we can understand it and respect it. So, you know, some of that. So, <clears throat> he was not unfamiliar with it. Now, I got a I gotta read to you his dream. Now, um, he's about my age. He's a really good guy. He's single, um, and he's he's got a very wry sense of humor, which I enjoy a great deal. So, um, I am going to read to you. I asked him to send me his dream. I hate it waiting for somebody to find something on their phone. Oh, I think we've all learned to do that. You're <laughs> <laughs> oh, so sweet. Oh, thank you. Um, God. I, and I, you know, just before this, I went through looking for It's a diabolic scene to <laughs> and to teach us patience. Mm -hmm. He writes, Bob, <clears throat> can you can you put that? <clears throat> um, uh, the, the, remember the last two there. The I sent it to you. Yeah. Well, Subsequent, subsequently, I sent him. No, not those. Sorry. Remember, I sent you a new set. I showed him. No. I don't know what you sent. I didn't get it. Okay. Intermission. Well, <laughs> wait, wait, I, let me let me just do this. Go ahead, Mitch. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead really. Let's be as informal as we need to be here. Did you get anything new on your phone? And send it to you on your phone? On the email or text? Yeah, here's yeah. Oh, that might be it. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the one I just showed. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's, let's go down to the bottom of it. Yeah. I jump too soon. Yes. Okay, go up one more. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's show that one. Let's mm -hmm. see So, I'd like to read to you the, the uh, I asked him to send me this dream. He says, Bob, this has always felt like a very numinous dream. He had this about six years ago. He said, I've never written it down before. I hope that whenever this, wherever this narrative goes, the dream will be treated with respect. You know, take your hat off in church. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so this is not the dream, but this is this is a piece of his art that, uh, that really resonates with me. He says, I am standing in the dark. In front of me, a funeral service appears to be going on. The body of a veiled woman is lying on a stone table. A priest with his back to me is standing in front of her. Above them, looking down, three large robed women watch the ceremony. I approach the body and the priest. 
Through the veil, I see the woman's face. She is very beautiful. Then I see muscles around her eye tighten. She is alive. She is wincing in discomfort. The priest is removing muscles and the tendons from her body. And it hurts her when they are disconnected from the bones. I hear a voice that says, she is returning to the spirit world. If you ever need her again, you can call her. Doug woke up thinking, shit, my life is a failure. My anima has abandoned me. <laughs> and we, we've learned yeah. what the anima is. And and he, he had done enough work at that point six years ago to know the significance of the dream. And, and he, he was crestfallen. I mean, he, he got it that she was being dismembered from the spirit world. And that would leave him without an anima. Um, so he said what kept him from total despair was he held on to the hope that he might call her. And he said, later, he said, I, I really wanted to get her back. Um, remember, she, he heard the voice say, she is returning to the spirit world, but you, if, if you ever need her again, you can call for her. It didn't necessarily mean she would come back, but you could call. Maybe she can answer. So Doug said this was very troubling for him that put him into a pretty good depression for a while. <clears throat> but he held on. He knew there was some hope. But, it, um, but he was still primarily very saddened. Um, and he retrospectively, he said to me, you know, back then, I didn't have much feeling, Bob. He goes, hell, I was a software tester and developer. <laughs> he said, he, he said he tried initially to call her, but he said, my request felt childish. He said, I had to learn how to feel in order to communicate with her in my life. So... He set out. He set out on the process of finding his feelings and going deep enough with them to be able to to offer a call that she would respond to. Now, <clears throat> Once a connection with the burrito has been firmly established. A back and forth dialogue can occur. It is the same with a collage or a collage image, but you've got to amplify it. You've got to work with it. It's like your books. You know, find something that you can really sink your emotional or um, spiritual teeth into and hold on and work it. Tim's been working the anima now for my on 30, 35 years. She's been working on me. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> I, I just want to grab that moment because she, she won't work on you unless you call her. Right. <laughs> yeah. That is what's up. I'm hearing that message this weekend, starting with Couscous talking about it, and that mm. that, that um, spirit will not come on its own. No, no. You have to call for it. And you have to do it with feeling, and you have yeah. to learn how to feel. Mm. And you know, 
some of my patients don't know how to feel. I, I, I say, well, what are you feeling? I don't know. I don't think about it very much. So what I've done for, for those people is I've said, you know, let's start with the basics, the primary colors. Oh, okay. I said, you've got yellow, happy. You've got red, angry. You've got blue, sad. And we start. And then I say you start mixing them and you learn jealousy. You learn uh, uh, alienation. Uh, you learn your feelings. A fun little story. So I taught um, one of my patients who has a, a little tradition with his son, a little guy, that they lay down together. He's, the child is under the covers, he's on top. And they talk about his son's day, Tommy's day. And they have a, just a nice little exchange there for five or 10 minutes and they talk about Tommy's day. Well, in the morning, he and his wife are downstairs having coffee and Tommy comes down and he sees his mom and he goes, mommy, I feel yellow today. <laughs> and and she, she looked at her husband and, and raised an eyebrow. And said, What's going on here? So, just a, so that's just an intro to feelings. <laughs> feelings uh, of the kindergarten, not even 101. Kindergarten feelings. But, but there are people who have no idea what they feel and no language to, to communicate. Yeah. Did, did, did your client uh, comment on this painting at all? Does it have a title? Do you know what it means? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, uh, this is a streetscape in Frederick, where I'm from. Uh -huh. And uh, he's only been painting for, he started in, uh, well, I'll tell you about him. I'll, I'll fast forward. Um, <laughs> he, he's got such a great sense of humor. I have, <laughs> I have it here somewhere. Um, he said he took his, he went, he had a camera around his neck. And in Frederick, we have a lot of art galleries. And he walked into an art gallery in 2010. And he said to the person that was, you know, in charge of that, he said, do you mind if I take pictures? And, he's, and, the, and the guy intuitively said to him, uh, I think you're an artist. And Doug said, I'm no artist. I've never, I've never painted, I've never drawn. He said, you've got that thing around your neck. You're an artist. So Doug, who's a sharp guy, he says, well, what's there to lose? So he took his first art class at the community college in 2010. And, and he took abstract sculpture. And he said, everybody else in the class was 18 years old. And he, and he said, I'm 60 years old. <laughs> he said, you know, though, he listened to himself and he said, I love it here. He said, this was my defining moment. And, and then he realized this has a special place for me. He said, um, and anyway, um, that, was, that was at 60 years old. That's when he started. Yeah, yeah. just looking at it in terms of the map, look at the south and the center. Oh, that. oh, yes. I, I hadn't even got thought red, of that. Red flag out there. I mean, you know, he, he looks like he's very happy there. And isn't your office in your office? Despite the well, dark near there. Around. Yeah, a couple, couple streets up and over. But a uh, fun little factoid. You know, we, we talk about the imaginary world, and one of my offices is in an old row house about uh, 150 years old. And many, you know, um, um, many times I'm in that office, and I look down and I imagine Robert E. Lee's Confederate troops going yeah. out to the Battle of South Mountain, and they marched by all day long mm -hmm. as, they, as they came through. 
um, and D.H. Hill was at the, at the back, Robert E. Lee was at the front, and I just imagined them going with their horses and their caissons and their marching, and that's just a little game that's I play. Kind of, maybe that's one of the reasons why you say you're on the battlefront. <laughs> yeah, the front lines of humanity. Yeah, I've been there a while. It's quite a place. <laughs> um, so um, let me. Let, so that's how Doug got started at 16 with the camera, and then he went to the abstract sculpture class, and and he was the old guy. Um, mm. got kind of excited here and I've lost my place. Um, so we, we went over. Um, the point is to, to establish this aesthetic path to the burrito, you, you got to amplify it. You got to work with it. Whether it's a collage that you keep working with or an aspect of it, amplify it as often as you can. And in that regard, I forget who it was. Maybe she's not here. Um, but, you know, I, I think in present Latter-day Alchemy, it's very helpful to have a totem animal. I would encourage anybody to make the effort to find your totem. And there was the woman yesterday who, who had the ibis. Yeah. And, and that ibis really spoke to me because I get so excited when somebody has embraced their totem because that is a great repository of synchronicity. Yeah. What's going on when you see them? What are you thinking? How often do they show up? And I really believe that there are other energies operating at levels we can we can't comprehend consciously, but they operate. Yeah. And um, here, here, yeah. There's a crow that keeps standing on that cross across the street, and it keeps every time I go up there, and it lands on there, and it calls at me. It's Really? <laughs> you know, you know, I, I, somebody <laughs> recently told me that that uh, that crows have the intelligence of a seven-year-old, and that you can teach them to do things. And if I remember the story, I haven't summoned it in a while. <clears throat> somebody raised a crow as a baby, you know, um, and and the crow would fly off, but it would come back and land on their shoulder. Yeah. And when they drank, the, the crow would come down and make motions with its beak, like it too wanted to drink from the cup. So you might be on to something. No, I must be something. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, one of the things that's really amazing about crows is they can determine if you're a good person or not, and then pass it on to the whole flock. And then in addition to that, when their children are born and they don't teach them, I think it's, I don't know how many generations, Ju Julia, do you know? But it's, pa their Jessica. children, uh, Jessica, excuse me, um, th that it's passed on and they can recognize that same Please. person having not been taught. Wow. Wow. And Ryan, I, um, I can't tell you how many people comment on that crow sitting on that crow. Really? It's so cool. <laughs> yeah, when they come over. Hey, did you see the crow sitting on the crow? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's something going on there for uh, sure. I want to tell a quick sure. story of uh, one morning coming into the kitchen of the house and a crow was banging against the window from the outside. And I um, sort of encouraged the crow to, you know, take it easy, I'm not going to hurt you, and everything's okay. The crow wouldn't stop. And I, well, I came into the kitchen and I said, there's something going on here. And you know, it's, anyway, there's something going on here. I went upstairs to my bathroom window, which is over the kitchen window, and the crow is banging on the bathroom window upstairs. Wow. So I came wow. up and said, well, we've got to figure out what's going on here. Open up the back door. And, and Wally, are you here? Wally? Are you stopped? My gosh. 
So uh, he steps out, and there's an empty carton for bottles, and a baby pearl is stuck in it. Oh, oh my God. And Wally takes the pearl out, and off they go. Oh, my well, gosh. Well, well, that was well, very wow, sophisticated wow. problem solving. That really is. The magic eyes can do that, too. I yeah. think that's more than a seven-year-old level. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have pre You know, <laughs> Frank Capra star. there was a crow that, it's the same crow that appears in all of his films. Really? And in a lot of other films as well. Uh, an incredible actor. Uh, essential in every single one of them. And it's just incredible. Yeah. Like, it's like how Hitchcock appeared in each one of his films. Mm -hmm. Capra mm -hmm. put this crow <laughs> in every yeah. single one of his films. It's, yeah. it's, it's remarkable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And here, can I do, do sure. one more? Because yeah. <laughs> this is just my love story. I felt this morning when we went and did the prayers that the bird, those birds came, the geese, because I was calling to them, because I love them so much, and I, I miss them when I leave. I go sit with them every day out at the uh, at Yano Seiko, and I just feel that way. You know, on Easter, two of them flew down, mated pair, and swam <coughs> toward me, and then just sat and looked. But here's the real story. This one of the women in my church, his father, they were in the uh, Japanese uh, internment camps. And her dad had been a doctor. And so he was looking for something to do. And so he began carving. And he carved the most magnificent things out of orange crates at the end of, of the orange crates. And he carved this incredibly beautiful hummingbird. I thought, this belongs in a museum. It is so... So I went and talked to her about it, and she said to me, do you know what happened to me the day my dad died? And I said, no. And she said, I went home, and there was a hummingbird stuck in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. And so and it, it couldn't get out. So she said she went and put her hands like that, and the hummingbird came and landed in her hands. Mm -hmm. And she took the hummingbird out and set it free. Mm -hmm. well, in Mexico, that's mm -hmm. considered... The hummingbird is considered to be the soul of the dead. See, thank this, you. this is all synchronicity. Yeah. You know, um, there. Are, I'm. I keep saying over and over to anybody that'll listen, including myself. You know, we always think we know all there is to know, even though we say to ourselves we don't know it all. But we always operate like this is the end of knowledge. We we know it all, and I just like I said yesterday. I love mystery. You know, if you're not trying to solve it, you can participate in it. Mm -hmm. And your participation allows your spirit to roam. So, I and would... And it unfolds. That's what I was experiencing. I would encourage everybody. Now, one, what, one alchemical tip. Let your totem come to you. But be on the lookout for it. Don't superimpose it. Know that if you open your heart or your spirit intentionally and you stay with it, I am, I am very confident that your totem will arrive in its own time, in its own way, the chaos of things. It will arrive in its own time. And you will know it. And both of you will be enhanced by the experience. And so I think a really good first step in Latter-day Alchemy is to embrace the totem as your spirit animal and let it come to you. Mm -hmm. And no, it, it may arrive in a dream. It may arrive in a, a synchronistic moment. Um, who knows how it's going to arrive? It may, it may arrive in a clash. Yeah, it may yeah. arrive on your front yard. Oh, you came, you came here to be my totem. Okay, well, nice to see you. I, I mean, and, and uh, amplify it. You know, make friends with it. Um, play with the idea. Let it play with you. Yes, you're, I'm sorry. No, I just spoke over your code. You're be hidden in your clash. <laughs> in my collage this time is I realized because it repeated itself in my collage and I didn't realize mm -hmm. that it had re repeated itself until I re 
put the clouds together, ah, there it is again. Yeah. And then two of us have got a play on, who was the person who spoke this morning about the American Indian? Oh, well, we have, the same per, we have the same image mm -hmm. in our play. Oh, yeah. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> what really worked for me <laughs> was yes. I, someone taught me, look for the animal or the image that comes to you in four distinct images. Hmm. And I, what I found over time is that at different times I can go into that image. I can go into that image. And it may be, <coughs> mine is mongoose. Oh, is it? And I see him, I see the curious <coughs> mongoose, I see the family of mongoose, and, and one of the four is the mongoose dead on the road. And I'll tell you, what's in that image is profound. <laughs> it's scary. But you go in there and it's incredible. Yes, I, I completely agree, John. Yeah. And I, I just think, again, I keep talking about the need to open your heart to your spirit and, and, and let it sustain you and sustain it. Otherwise, you end up being angry old man where the waters of life have dried up on you. And, yes. Does, does one's totem change? I don't consider that I have a totem. Okay. Uh, but I do consider that I uh, dialogue with animals. Uh huh. That it's not one animal. Okay. So that would be fine. I mean, there's there's no fixed yeah. aspect to it. But you, you see, when when I think you embrace the magic or the mystery of a totem or animals, mm -hmm. your spirit now is moving. Mm -hmm. It it's being sustained in in that in that magic, in, in that mystery. And I think that's, boy, do we need a, collectively, do we need a, 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 a domestic uh, renewal of spirit in this country? Um, so I'm upset about that. You know, about that. But, but what, 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 do you think it might change? Yeah, you know, I, my, my feeling, Judith, is um, it certainly could. But you know it when you know it. And if you just... I know that mine is changing now. Is it? Upon reflection over the last year, a particular bird uh, checks me out every day, and if I don't go out and feed that bird, it comes to my window. Oh, wow. And then I, rather than the polar bear. Rather than the polar bear. And, and the um, bird showed up. I visited a friend, and the bird showed up while well, I was at the friend's house. Now, whether it was the exact same bird or not, it was in the same neighborhood, but... Um, but... Yeah, it you looks know. me in the eye and makes contact. Mark definitely looks me in the eye. Mm. or turns his head sideways. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yes? Well, I wonder if, if having a totem or having an experience with, with like that or, or with the same animal over again or a changing <coughs> thing is, is more is more of an invitation to to the larger relationship to the symbolic world, symbolic life. Or, if, or the burrito, as I would say. The, the, uh, the, the right, world but of the, the, the unconscious. The, un the unconscious or the burrito responding to symbols that come to us. And maybe the totem is an invitation to open to symbolic life. And, and and once opened and participated in, there's renewal there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because you're doing it consciously. Mm -hmm. And that's the key. And, uh, and each animal has its own lesson to teach. And I learned so much from the polar bear about child care. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but uh, I wondered about the way the bird was looking. And so I looked up how the vision of the bird works and learn that the bird sees uh, so much more than we do because they bring it, the object in to both eyes and then they have a transformation in which they understand the object. So they are seeing things from both sides at once mm. and transforming a much more intelligent vision than we have. Uh -huh. And so what that lesson has I'm not quite sure, but I'm working on it. <laughs> well, I mean, perfect. As you research a particular animal, you'll learn particular skills that 
you could use. Yes. I sure experience it that way with the invitation <coughs> that you feel like you're just called on to keep opening, keep opening, keep opening. And it's it's more than animals. It's trees and tree roots and and uh, microbial life and planets. It's all you can open to all of it. And times learn from all of that too. Yeah. But I think it starts with the challenge of the personal totem. Yeah, probably. And, and then, you know, or, or the challenge of the animals. I, mean, I, I don't... <clears throat> I know I've only got part of this. It's like the blind man and the elephant. Now, I, I know I've got a part of this right, but I'm, I don't assume I got it all. <laughs> so that's my message is, you know... So could I just sure, add, Jessica. Um, hearkening back to Fern in Charlotte's Web, who sits very quietly and still and waits until she gains the animal's trust, there's a kind of receptivity that you go into. And I do think that a certain animal will be sent to you at the right time, a totem animal, but I, I do think it, it changes. And and I'm, as you're pointing out, I, I think you've got to, in your own way, open yourself um, to that arrival, to, to an, invita an intentional invita invitation that sustains, then, then you're enriched. Because, sure. go ahead. Oh, also, um, Colleen will often say, is a character in a collage aware of another character in the collage? And I think of that with, with observing animals and relating to them, that, that if you show them that you're aware of them but don't, make direct eye contact or maybe turn your body away so you don't look like you're a predator, they accept you more as part of the environment instead of a threat. And so there's a, a communication that you learn from them. I am, um, Judy and I had just come back from Africa and uh, I, I have the good fortune of having some water flow through my property in the woods. And in the evening time, I'd gone down to the path by the water in the woods. <clears throat> and there's a, a, a big old sycamore branch. They, they have tremendous limbs. And about 12 feet up, a great horned owl is sitting over the path. And I walked up to it, and I thought, what would an animal do in the Maasai Mara? they would turn around and go away. So I did, <laughs> because the owl was saying, uh, don't challenge me. And, and animals in the wild give each other space. So I was happy I learned that lesson instead of being, you know, <laughs> an aggressive American, you know. My tree, my path. My <laughs> exactly, exactly, <laughs> you know, so. <clears throat> Uh, so, um, so let your totem come to you. All right, uh, let me read Doug's cat dream. Where did I put it? See, I get so caught up in my, here it is. My sensation function is by far my weakest. So I never know where anything is. I don't know what time I leave. I don't know when I arrive. Um, so, ah, there, here we go. Uh, this is a dream Doug had a few weeks ago, okay? My cat dream. I am in a busy public building. I decide to leave. When I open the door, a cat outside sneaks past me and enters the building. <laughs> I'm annoyed by this, and I decide I should go and get the cat out of the building. When I open the door to go in, the cat brushed by me and leaves. <laughs> when I open the door a third time, the cat goes back in, but this time I close the door on her and make her squeeze through. <laughs> I don't hurt her, but she must feel annoyed by it. I go back into the building myself to look for her, but I don't see her. Then I hear the sound of a car engine in another room. 
I look in the room and I see my car. The cat has opened the driver's door and is trying to reach in to push the gas pedal down. <laughs> Aside from just being a cute dream, um, I interpreted it as Doug. Um, um, you've got you got to get going with your process. The, um, the cat's trying to help you by accelerating your process. So, <laughs> so recently, and, and this is one of the reasons why this entire lecture or talk tonight has got turned around synchronicity, um, because I, I was going to go in an entirely different direction. But Doug's story is so compelling as a Latter-day Alchemist, I had to share it with you. So, recently Doug came in for a session and told me to be careful of the cat that followed him up the stairs. Oh. oh, okay. And he, he sat down in the other chair that my patients sit in. And because I've had some experience with fairies, I knew exactly what to do. I reached down, I called to the cat, I picked it up, I held it, I petted it, and I gave it back to Doug, and he put it on the floor. And um, <clears throat> then we went on with the session. And um, when we left, Doug opened the door and let the cat out and followed her down the stairs. <laughs> and um, we had a very nice cat experience that most people wouldn't have seen, but we both knew she was there. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, um, so so was there something in there in terms of you showing Doug how to be with a cat that he how a male can be with the feline? No. And he but he instead puts it down, but that doesn't matter because the whole Well he he told me the cat had followed him up the stairs. Yeah. yeah. So I just wanted to affirm, because I knew the level Doug was working at, and I've had some experience at yeah. that level. So I knew what to do. Mm -hmm. So I reached out, picked the cat up, petted it like you would a cat, looked yeah. at it, cooed at it, and then gave the cat back to Doug, yeah. who then put the cat on the floor, and the cat hung out with us for the rest of the session, and it was time to go. Doug opened the door, and we both watched the cat scoot down the stairs. Business had been accomplished. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, um, so then, it's not over yet. This, this gets better. So recently, he had awakened uh, in the morning, in the early morning dawn, and he was in that interstitial place where he's not quite awake, but he's not asleep. He's just awoken, and he asked himself in that hazy interstitial place between sleep and consciousness what the cat's name was. And then he saw it spelled out. I'll, I'll, I'll write it for you. This blew me away. The name of the cat is C-L-A-P-I-T-H-A. <laughs> I've never heard that. And he said, it wasn't a sound. He said he just saw the words. And he quickly wrote them down. Oh, Clopithal, that's your name. Yo! So, so, so he looked it up. And CLA is the Latin root that means key. And pith. P-I-T-H, means essence. So this is the cat that is the key of the essence or the essence of the key or that. And, and then I understood why the word pithy mm -hmm. is used as a very, very strong way to describe um, a something written or something said. It's pithy. 
because pith means essence. So, so there, there you got it. Now we know the name of the cat that's been hanging out with Doug. <laughs> and, then, and then, and I was looking, um, he has pictures of his artwork on his phone. So uh, he handed me the phone, and I looked at the wallpaper, and it was this beautiful picture of Bastet, which is the name of the Egyptian um, cat god mm -hmm. that is carved in black stone or onyx, and it's beautiful. And that's the wallpaper on his phone. And he never said, hey, Bob, look at the cool wallpaper. Got. He just handed me the phone, and of course I messed it up, and so the wallpaper came on, and then we had to find what we were looking for again. Point is, he had amplified this, that this is now starting to take deeper and deeper meaning to him, especially when Clopithal has, now, now he knows his, his spirit totem. <laughs> but that's that's what's going on here. You see, he's taking the dream that's being offered to him from the burrito. He's acknowledging it. He's enhancing it from the negretto and telling the burrito that he's working it. And the burrito continues to give him more. And now, now you've got that dialogue going between the burrito and the negretto. And that's what I'm talking about in Latter-day Alchemy, that connection. Oh. <laughs> then, Doug something. We're, we're talking about the cat. And he says to me, hey, Bob, the cat only comes when the male cat is talking to the seven dead. And <laughs> skip will like that because... Because at, at the same time he referenced Jung's Green Dream, which maybe someday I'll do for you all, but I, I presented it to the Jung Society, and Jung was given a cryptic note like that, and, and Skip knows it from the Seven Sermons of the Dead, too. So he, he combined those in just one just pithy statement to me that made me laugh out loud because he had so connected my journey of late with, with his cat. <laughs> so he said, I'm coming apart here. He said, during the pandemic, he said, I couldn't go out, so I went in. <laughs> and now I, 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 we'll, we'll get into some of his artwork. And then we'll be done. Um, so he has this dream. Oh, I've got, I've got the story here. Here's, here's a good one. Um, would you, would you bring that in, Jeff? Yeah. Okay. Here's, here's a dream he's, he had within the year said, I had a dream. Fantastic. No, no, just this. I want, I want just that one. Can we do that? No, that. There's one of just that. Yes, that's it. Okay, <laughs> so he had a dream, and, and Sherry might not like this, but... Um, <laughs> That's why I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm teasing. Um, I had a dream. <laughs> I had a dream where it was at the opening of an art show. It was a show for meaningless art. Maybe you won't like this either, Colleen. I had a dream where I was <laughs> where I was at the opening of an art show, and it was a show for meaningless art. And a woman who was a fabric artist entered a piece, but it was rejected because it had meaning. <laughs> like WTF, what are you talking about? So I woke up and I decided to paint a meaningless painting. 
I painted the torso of my father and an older Japanese couple near Tokyo in 1953 from an old photograph. When I finished, I decided to finish the painting with feet and heads, and I made it a triptych. But this, this is what he painted for meaningless art. That was his best offering for meaningless art. <laughs> so, so go ahead down, I think he's got. So then, then, yep, yeah, that's it. Then he painted the, the heads and the bottom. <laughs> and, but what, so typical of Doug, so he didn't do the triptych the way you do a triptych. <laughs> he did it the wrong way. Because <laughs> you got you to build on meaningless art in a meaningless way, I guess. I don't know. We'd have to ask him. <laughs> okay. So I remember, here's, here's, here's an example. Well, you know, here's a Latter-day Alchemist. Doug is a Latter-day Alchemist. We all are. By the way, we're all, we're all central roots. All right, so um, I got a little bit more to share. Now that you're getting to know Doug, he's quite a guy. He, he, he's quite a guy. So we did the art class. Um, he said, um, "Let's see if I can get this one." So I said, Doug, you know, I'm going to be presenting you to my group. Um, so I need, I'm, um, uh, but I need more from you. And so he sent me this. He said, Bob, I'm not sure if this is what you are looking for, but here's something. Every painting that I've worked on has surprised me. I would decide on a subject and then try to paint it as well as I could. And every time I was surprised, I, I came to look forward to finding the, the surprise in my painting. He said in the intro to art at my community college, we were supposed to draw our faces showing areas of light and dark. Oh, incidentally, hold it right. Go back here. I, mm. I, can you make that a little smaller so we can see her? Mm. He said, and I, I know no more than what Doug said. This is his work. He said, she wanted to visit you guys. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't, so here she is. She's visiting. <laughs> What's her name? I have no idea. I know no more than what he said because he had sent me a, a file of pictures and he just said, and that one, uh, she just wanted to come visit. Yeah. <laughs> so there she is. And keep that one. Up. So here's what he said about this. He said, I decided to do, to do this in the intro to art class at my community college. We were supposed to draw our faces showing areas of light and shade. I decided to do it using pieces of colored paper. When I started to put the pieces together, I thought the darkest piece on the left of the face looked like a woman dancing, and I was stunned by it. Mm -hmm. He said, um, I think it was Winslow Homer who said, when you paint, paint exactly what you see. Anything else you have to offer will be there anyway. Mm -hmm. So, so she's dancing, and um, and this is a pretty good rendition of Doug. Um, I would rec I would recognize him in, in that. Okay. So. Um, he looks like his father. Right here, he looks like Yo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he does. And I'll tell you, there's, there's a, there, we're sitting on a tragedy here, too, folks. But um, 
he thinks his father, you know, the guy in the in the picture, um, actually knew Edinger back in the day. And I'll, I'll get to that. Um, um, so um, he said, "Okay, let's go to this one." In drawing class, we covered our paper with charcoal and used erasers to make the picture. With this, te with this technique, when you make a mistake, you cover it with charcoal and start over. I copied an Andrew Wyeth painting, The Lovers. I loved the window, and a couple of years later, I realized the woman looked a lot like an old girlfriend of mine. And, and he said, the window was the surprise. He said, she is my projected anima. She came to mean even more. It took me years to realize she was my anima in 2011. But he put it in the retort. And it the retort worked its magic. And over time, he came to realize that this is his anima. Excuse me, retort? I don't remember what. The retort, the retort is the magic oven in alchemy. Mm -hmm. This is where the mystery takes place. So you, in the old days, you, uh, you did whatever magical stuff you're doing with your material, uh, lead, uh, quicksilver, sulfur, and you put it in the retort, and and the retort is heated, <clears throat> and so in that process something magical takes place. It's analogous to what we call today the black box. I don't know why or how, but it, this is how it comes out. So the retort is an alchemical term. Frequently, any alchemist worth worth their salt or lead. Um, had a had a retort. Um, like the kiln. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or or that. Yeah, or, yeah. That, that's your retort. It's in there. Yeah, magic is happening. Now, let's do this guy. I made four portraits of an old man in my town. My son, my father, and my mother. And I've got them somewhere, and I'd like to show you, but um, technology. I'm just grateful we can do this. Um, yeah. uh, portraits brought an intimacy that shook me. Some of my family were upset because I depicted my mother with her dementia. I realized that portraits can become the real thing and that I had to accept responsibility. I knew this guy in town. We don't have a big town. It's about the size of, yeah, it's a little larger than Helena. And we all called him the Yo-Ho Man because everybody he saw he went, yo ho! Yo ho! And you kind of had to acknowledge the guy. And he was harmless. Yo ho! <laughs> He's a veteran of uh, the Korean War. He got separated from his unit and was three days in the wilds of Korea without anybody. And if I'm not mistaken, and I could be, he even had the temerity to knock on a, uh, a th the tank of the Chinese, uh, but they didn't kill him. And he was just the Yoho man. Yoho! Friendly as anything, but he wouldn't stop. Yo! And it, it, and I guess he's dead now, but he's part of Doug's family. And then 
Can we go to that one? Do you have that one? Oh, oh, stop there. Here is Doug's dad in 1953. And this is where the uh, triptych, uh, this is what Doug painted. Um, and as you recall, that middle part was the meaningless piece of art he made. That's 1953. His dad worked for Merck. He was a, he was a go-getter, up-and-comer, um, made uh, pretty good money. Um, there's more to be said about that. Can we do? Can we do him? Yeah. Oops, I don't have him. Fooey. Maybe I can send him. going to do um, Can we take it? Everybody okay? All right. Um, he said in the first one, Yoho Man, he said he lived his life. He was ridiculed by society, just totally beat up. I gave him some dignity in this painting. This man was his wife's mother's brother. He was sent to the front lines in Korea. He was, he got hit, so he was wounded, and wandered three days. He wasn't a bum, he spoke properly. He just was indomitable when, it, when he wanted to engage you. Yeah, has it hasn't come up yet? There you go. All right, so about this, So, well, there's the dignity that Doug gave this man who, who served our country and was absolutely the worst for the experience. Um, okay, let's go to his son. Uh, I didn't get that. Oh, did you send that? Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. This is Doug's son. Now, he went through a nasty divorce with a crazy woman. So crazy, in fact, uh, I don't think I can tell that story. We're on camera. I just leave it at that, okay, folks? Some, some things shouldn't be recorded. Um, so this is his son. And he hadn't seen this guy in seven years. Um, so he painted his son's portrait and offered to meet his son for lunch at a restaurant. And this is seven years. They live in the same town. As a matter of fact, I drive by their house every day when I drive to work. Um, they're right around the corner from me. That's Frederick. <laughs> um, <clears throat> he wrote to his son, if you come, I'll have the painting with me. I didn't think he'd show. His son did come, looked at the painting and said, yeah, that's a pretty good likeness. Um, reduce it a little bit, Tim. He said, on a, on a technical, let's, let's go back. Black. 
Well, yeah, just so, so we can. He said on a technical level, that shirt was the hardest thing okay. in the whole picture. By the way, it looks perfectly natural to me. But go ahead and paint it. <laughs> so I just thought that was very interesting. And his son agreed that that looked like him. He, um, he goes for a walk once a week with his son. It's the only time they get together at the son's insistence. Okay, let's go down to the next one. He said, this is my father at 18. His father had been a very successful businessman working for Merck, one of the first people to go to Japan in 53, not long after the war. Um, he said his dad had his first breakdown at 40. He left a high position at Merck, and he left it to become a pastor. So at 40 years old, he rejected what he was doing and turned to become a minister for a church. But he had a breakdown. And he really thinks that Ed Edinger, who is a, a tremendous Jungian, many of you know who he is, he writes elegantly and has the ability, his gift, I, I have the, uh, um, I have the, the, uh, the ode, the, um, um, they dedicated, I forget the name of the, uh, of the periodical, but a Jungian periodical dedicated the periodical to Ed Edinger. So there's all these great stories about Edinger and some of his stuff. Um, and Edinger himself said, my gift is I can translate what Jung wrote <laughs> to people that can understand it easier. And I, I do think that's a gift. Um, he said, this is my dad at 40. Um, Edinger may have been his father's sci uh, psychiatrist at Rockland State Hospital in 1963, where Edinger was uh, chief of the medical center there at Rockland. Um, Skip knows what I'm talking about. Where's Rockland? Rockland is in New York State. Okay. Um, and um, he said it was a terrible place. Uh, they used heavy-duty electroshock back then. Remember, this is 1963. And, and in Maryland, <laughs> uh, the Baltimore Sun did in 66, 67, an expose on the terrible treatment of psychiatric patients. John knows um, the, the story behind the story. You know, uh, heavy-duty water hoses, um, Terrible confinement. Insulin uh, shock therapy, all of that. And the thing about ECT, electroshock therapy, they did it without any guidelines. I mean, they, they did it in people that we know now it would have been useless. They did it without giving any agents to paralyze the body to pre you know, prevent physical damage from the seizures. They gave huge, massive amounts of electricity. And it was just, it was, it was brutal. It was brutal. It needed to be put a stop to. Yeah. And, and in the Baltimore Sun, the expose changed everything about how the mentally ill were incarcerated, basically. Um, so anyway, he said in this painting, his desire with this painting was that every brush stroke he used was to be seen. And that's the way he um, created it. He said, I said, Doug, how, how do you have such a variety of styles? And he, he said, I have no sense of what I can do. It's a mystery to me. I get a surprise every time I create a painting. Um, he said, this painting helped him enormously. He 
He said his dad ended up killing himself. Mm -hmm. And he said he grieved for 14 years. And upon the conclusion of this painting, his grieving stopped. <coughs> he grieved for 14 years, then wrote an act of imagination in which we talked to each other. And when he spoke to his dad, his dad spoke to him from the pulpit in his act of imagination, and his grieving stopped. So that speaks for itself. Um, next one. Can you, can you make it smaller so we can see the whole picture? Thanks. While Tim's finally getting it, there, there it is, there it is. Um, <clears throat> he said he was really proud that he captured his mother with dementia. Mm. Um, he was proud of it, and he sent it to his sister, who berated him for it. Mm. She said, couldn't you paint her younger and with a smiling face. He said then he realized he had a responsibility because the painting becomes live. If you do it right, it becomes live. And I captured my mother's mental state. And I, I just applaud him for his courage and his ability mm -hmm. and, and his willingness to look at right, well, right at it paint it, and, um, and I think it's a beautiful picture. It's life, you know? Mm -hmm. Life. Yeah. Doug, about <laughs> the triptych that we saw and the the photograph that he had of his dad that he turned into the painting. He said he, he chased that with his dad. He said his dad at, back then could be gone for as much as three months, which is a long time. That'll, that'll induce some abandonment in a child. Um, so he found the shrine on Google Earth, and he said it was very eerie that now he could visit the exact shrine that his dad had stood in front of 60 years ago, basically. And that gave him goosebumps. He said that's, that's what made him decide to finish it and not just stay with meaningless art. His brother and his sister don't like it because it doesn't look like their father. So, so this, is, this is individuation, because when your aesthetic speaks to you, it's not for anybody's consumption but your own and the Veritos to witness it. So don't get caught up in how well you do it, how good it looks, or it's other people's approbation. Courageously do it. Stay with it. And know that you are communicating to something very powerful somewhere else. But if you, if you allow the collective to offer approbation for your aesthetic, it's going gonna, it's gonna to queer your aesthetic. It's going to mess it up. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you can't, you, you've, you've got to have the courage to know what you're doing. Skip. Bob, um, in the earlier painting, going back one, uh, you made the statement that um, the father went from this high-paid job to becoming a pastor, and you characterized that as a psychotic break. I'm sorry. That's I the way you said it. I Is that what you meant? No, no. Did you do that? 
Well, not, that I, it's not what I meant to say. I didn't mean to, to say that caused the break. Um, I think in the aftermath of all of that, he became a pastor. I don't know the sequence of events. And if I had time, folks, I would, I would tell you a synchronicity story. When I get my next book written, you can read it. But this, this is a, a, just a back of your neck synchronicity story that I, I don't have the time. Of, and it, it's got to be told in detail for appreciation. But it's also related to this man. Okay, uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that you clarified for the video yeah. what you were losing. No, I didn't. I mean, didn't mean to say that. that. Lose to, I, I quit did Merck cause a breakdown? No, no. no. Well, what I heard was that, that what, what I heard was that you, he had a breakdown and became a pastor. Oh, and and that's I just thought that was too facile. So I wanted yeah, to yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure. He had certainly a midlife crisis that resulted in a breakdown, but I think he was a very bright man. I think as he put his life back together, he reassessed himself, and he said, I have a calling that I have to answer. And he became a, a pastor, but he, he had demons he struggled with and ultimately took his own life at 53, which... Is tragic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, just uh, let me share with you. I, I wanted to talk about the responsibility that Doug takes for his paintings and how his paintings have taught him to be responsible as well. Um, uh, and then. Um, if you could go to this one, please. This is this is truly alchemical. If you would, would you get would you get that one? This and this will be fun to do because Doug's in process with this one. This one. So here's how. Here's how he did it. <clears throat> this is his latest that he's working on. This was our last session, just before I came. Um, he drew this one. He drew the negative space of the triptych that he had done. Then he turned it sideways. Then, <laughs> so he turned it sideways so it looked like a landscape. And then he put in a sun to augment the landscape. Mm -hmm. And Tim was looking at the crystal sun, the, what was the sun dog. Sun dog this morning. And <clears throat> so he put in a sun to, and he was reading Edinger at the time, and Edinger was speaking about the power of squaring a circle. So he squared, he, he took the negative space, turned it sideways, now he has squared it, um, uh, and uh, put in the big circle. He said, he squared it, then he put in the big circle, he said, now I like it. He said, these were drawn freehand because I don't, I don't want anything to be perfect. And then he said, it feels like I've become the object of the burrito's expression. I never know what I'm going to get. I call it the surprise. <laughs> Here. I won't share it. Stupid joke. 
Um, and then the last one, Tim. So I don't know how this is going to come out. Um, I'd love to share it with you someday. Um, if we meet again next year, um, I'll be sure to bring it, and you can see where he took it. Now, these are a series. These are just, um, these are his most recent creations. He said, these are sketches were done only in five minutes from dream vignettes. <clears throat> so if you will, take us, take us through. They, they, there should through be what? more there. Um, can you... Um, no, oh, that's the only one you got, Fooey. All right, well, they're just, <laughs> so he had included, um, here, I'll send it to Tim. They're interesting, but again, um, they, um, sketches but the point is he's honoring his dream with creations so the dream speaking to him and he is responding in kind and um, I don't know what's going to become of these but that's not the important thing the, the important thing is he's established a relationship a vector a you know a, a communication with the burrito and the burrito is responding and he's very he's enhanced by this it's mysterious he doesn't know what he's going to do next but he's enriched by it so I wanted to share that with you just oh, as an example of latter-day alchemy and before we end I'll before I want to read you one more poem I'd like Judy to read it but before we end I'm going to tell you another story this is hot off the press with an entirely new patient, wonderful guy, hard charging IT dude. He's made a lot of money, a happening guy, very, very logos. Um, and uh, at 53, 52, he's looking around for meaning in his life, but he's sharp enough to know he hasn't found it. And the, yes, thank you. These are, um, can you scroll? These are, these are just, um, dream images that he's he's painted in five minutes. Um, that's it. So I want to tell you the story. We'll call this guy Mickey Mantle for fun. Mickey number seven was my hero when I was a kid. So <clears throat> he and I are, are working. And he's also a very good musician. Um, um, and he said, you know, <clears throat> I've been encouraging him to explore the other side of his brain and see what comes up. And he said, you know, I got, I got this recording from somebody I know, and she's playing piano. And she asked me to create a guitar piece um, for it. And he said, I was working on my chords as I'm playing guitar. He said, I'm working it over in, that's okay. I'm, I'm working it over and over and over. And he said, you know, Dr. Bob, I, I saw this little girl in this beautiful dress dancing in this eight-sided room with, with sunlight coming in. And she's just dancing around listening to me play and she's seven or eight nine years old and she's just dancing having a wonderful time and he said i've, I've never had an experience like that he said is this what you want and i said yeah yeah that's that's pretty close yeah we're we're getting there it's not right it's irrational you know it's you haven't thought it out and and you played your music and she danced for you and so he put it together uh, with the piano piece, sent it back to the woman that played the piano, and he said, you know, the darndest thing happened when I did this. I had the image of a little girl dancing in an eight-sided room with 
big windows and beautiful sunlight coming in. And she wrote back, <clears throat> you know, that's who I imagined when I made the piano piece mm. for this. <laughs> so we don't know everything. Mm. And so here's the little girl in the woman's eye that makes the piano piece. And somehow that got conveyed in the music and he picked it up and he played it. And <laughs> now that little girl belongs to both of them. Mm. And who knows? Does the story continue? Does it not? I have no idea, but this is the alchemy of which I'm talking. Mm -hmm. So, um, Judy's a fan of Bosco's too, um, but um, she especially likes this poem, so I've asked her to read it for us. Um, you last night in a dream. You can hardly remember. I wished you a star. I carried that dream through a clear black night late in November. It was a great wish, uttered in moonlight, planted in hope, nourished with love. It was sent to sag, your frightened heart, with time to heal and the courage to grow. Your hard, uneven nights will eventually ebb as the shards of pain meld into mourning. May that distant dream bring a joy to your heart as dawn's soft light caresses your soul. Thompson. Can you read it again? Oh, yeah, I'm going to read it again and a little louder. <clears throat> Thompson, I visited you last night in a dream. You can barely remember. I wished you a star to carry that dream through a clear black night late in November. It was a quiet wish, uttered in moonlight, planted in hope, nourished with love. It was sent to Sav, your frightened heart, with time to heal and the courage to grow. Your hard, uneven nights will eventually ebb as the shards of pain meld into mourning. May that distant dream bring a joy to your heart as dawn's soft light caresses your soul. Thompson. Thanks, Judy. Thompson in German means to dance, mm -hmm. I'm told. Yep. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's wonderful. <laughs> we're, all, we're all alchemists. We know the retort. We know the anima. We know the burrito. Go, go, go. Skip. Skip. Uh, just a minute. Um, that's all we've got for the official program until the play tonight, which is at 7.30. So, as I understand it, you're all... No, we're bringing... Susie's bringing pizza here so you can keep working on your stuff and food will magically appear. And meanwhile, the, the theater crew is going to go down and get ready for the play. And we'll, we're going to have a really powerful evening with the, the presentation they're going to do. Skip, do you want to make an announcement about your calligraphy? Oh, yeah. Yes, just, that's a good time. Just about my uh, calligraphy. In the front room, I have pieces that I semi 
feel are finished. But back here, I, there's a maroon notebook right over here. Right, right next to your chin, Diane. Uh -huh. And uh, in that, there are about 20 transparent uh, sleeves. And anything that you find in there, if you like it or want to have it for yourself, just for reference, you're free to take it. And just so you understand the coloring, besides the black and gold, um, I, I tried to divide up words that I was working with according to Jung's four psychological uh, functions. So sensing, intuitive, thinking, and feeling. And so sensing is in green. Um, intuitive is in purple. If you see something that looks like black, it's actually purple because I don't paint black at all. I don't buy black normally. Uh, and uh, thinking is blue and feeling is red. And so I divided up almost every sentence based on the psychological function that was engaged by those sentences. And that's the process that I am using. And so I'm using this calligraphy as my personal meditation. I don't, I'm, I'm not an artist like Tim or Colleen or uh, Sherry. So I'm not presenting my stuff because I think I'm an artist. I'm presenting it because I think we all need to be artists at home. And I think it got beat out of most of us in elementary school and high school. And uh, I think we need to turn that around personally, somehow in our education system. And so that this is my personal process. I don't ever expect to be a great calligrapher like Sherry. I'm just doing it for myself to try to understand these things. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you.